Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. And today, I'm standing in front of Sydney's world famous Harbour Bridge. And for 90 years this year, it served to connect Sydney's two halves. And every day, hundreds of watercraft sail underneath it, from yachts to cabin cruisers and ferries. But if you'd stood here 90 years ago in 1932, you would have seen some very different ships steaming underneath. In December that year, the magnificent luxury liner RMS Strathaird sailed out of Sydney Harbour on a historic trip, effectively becoming the world famous company P&O's first cruise ship to ever operate in Australia. For its time, the Strathaird was hyper modern, stylish and extremely comfortable for passengers, but 1932 was a very long time ago. Behind me is the MV Pacific Encounter, one of the latest additions to P&O's Australian cruise ship lineup and she follows in the tradition as set by Strathaird all those 90 years ago. But a lot has changed since then. So today, let's take a look at the differences in shipbuilding and technology and see just how different the Pacific Encounter is to Strathaird. For centuries, ships had plied the world's oceans, taking people to new lives in faraway places. This was especially true of Australia, it's hard to imagine somewhere more remote to the European or American continents, except for New Zealand, of course. Sailing ships would brave the elements, sailing for months at a time in the hope that they would avoid storms and shipwrecks to land safely in the New World. Often they did, but often they did not, and thousands of shipwrecks litter Australia's coastline. The Peninsula and Oriental Steamship Company, today known as P&O, became a firm fixture on the Australian route, offering a reliable, safe and comfortable service for passengers and by the 1920s was dominating the waves. In the latter part of that decade, the P&O Company chairman, Lord Inchcape, had dreamt up an all-new trailblazing pair of sister ships that would set a new standard for size, luxury, speed and comfort for fair-paying passengers, and the result was the RMS Strathnava and its sister ship, the Strathaird. Today, over 90 years later, p and has introduced a new pair of sister ships to their lineup, the Pacific Encounter and the Pacific Adventure. But just how different are they to Strathnava and Strathaird? What has changed in 90 years? Well, one of the key differences comes down to their reason for being. See, Strathaird was built as an ocean liner, while Pacific Encounter is a dedicated cruise ship. But, I hear you ask, what's the difference? Well, think of it like this. A cruise ship is like a party limousine, but an ocean liner is a bus. In the limousine, getting there is most of the fun. Sure, the destination is likely to be special, but there's plenty of fun to be had on board. This is true of cruise ships. They aim to skirt around bad weather at sea and just provide a comfortable, relaxing time on the ocean for vacationers. But ocean liners are different. They are built to maintain regular scheduled services like a bus. In the days before jet airliner travel, this was the only way to travel long distances, so the timetables and schedules had to always run on time. To ensure this, ocean liners were designed and built specifically to power through the ocean, no matter what the conditions were, to make it on time and maintain their busy schedule. Believe it or not though, an ocean liner can become a cruise ship by taking it off its normal schedule and running a leisurely cruise for paying passengers to simply enjoy. And this is what P&O trialled all the way back in 1932. See, back then, the idea of cruising at sea for fun was only new. Until then, the safety of ships at sea and the overall comfort level of passengers hadn't been good enough for passengers to want to go to sea for fun in the first place. But by 1932, ships like Strathaird were like floating palaces, huge, stable and a marvel in their own right. And at the same time, new standards of living and a rise in wages led to the creation of a new group of people, the middle class, who bridged the gap between rich and poor, and for the first time in history, average working men and women could save disposable income and spend it on entertainment or travel, and holidaying was no longer just for the rich and famous. P&O recognised an opportunity to provide a special and unique holiday experience, to sail on board one of the world's newest and most glamorous ships to a gorgeous and remote holiday destination and then back home. In Australian waters, it had never been done before on this scale, and so to test it out, the stunning new RMS Strathaird was chosen for the task. Over Christmas 1932, the ship would leave from Sydney Harbour, make its way to Brisbane and then sail out to the remote Norfolk Island, a tiny island 1500 kilometres or 902 miles off the coast of Northern Australia. It would be a five day cruise and the trip was advertised, and just three days later, incredibly, it was fully booked. 
On December 23, 1932, the gleaming white Strathaird steamed out of Sydney Harbour for its first historic Australian cruise. Flash forward to today, 2022, and sitting at that same wharf where Strathaird had departed all those years ago is the mighty, spectacular ship Pacific Encounter. The ship was built in Italy and completed in 2002, one of the state-of-the-art grand-class cruise ships constructed for Princess Cruises. Strathaird was, for its time, one of, if not the, largest passenger ships sailing out of Australia at 22,284 gross registered tonnes and 638 feet or 195 metres long. But by contrast, the Pacific Encounter is an absolute giant, dwarfing the old Strathaird with its huge 109,000 gross tonne bulk and its 951 foot or 290 metre length. But it's not just sheer size for the sake of it. The bigger ship provides more space for passenger entertainment and exciting things to do, and Pacific Encounter boasts a massive array of amenities for passengers. See, back in 1932, ocean liners like Strathaird were designed luxuriously, sure, but with a utilitarian purpose in mind, to carry passengers quickly from point A to point B. Back then, people's entertainment needs were much simpler, so the ships featured public spaces and amenities that would, to the modern passenger, appear laughable. Strathaird's two classes of passengers had access to their own lounges where refreshments were served. First class even got their own dance floor up on the promenade deck. This was the jazz age after all. If the main lounge was too formal and a fair, first class passengers could relax in the veranda lounge outside instead. They had access to a smoking room, a reading and writing room, and a veranda cafe up on the boat deck where they could just take the air and sip a cup of tea. For children, there was even a nursery and a playroom. First class had an elegant enclosed swimming pool, but tourist class had one too, down on the main deck. In fact, tourist class had many of the same kind of rooms as first class, albeit decorated in a bit more of a subdued style. Both classes, of course, featured enormous and stylish dining saloons where they could take their main meals and miles of deck space and promenades to stretch their legs. It was all stylish, luxurious, and for the time, very impressive. But shipboard activities for passengers were mainly confined to reading, writing, chatting, strolling, or maybe occasionally swimming in the pools. By contrast, Pacific Encounter is a floating wonderland with dozens of impressive passenger spaces and amenities. Towering lobbies welcome the passenger as they step on board. Of course, there is no class segregation on the Pacific Encounter because the whole ship is effectively first class. For dining options, the vast ship offers stylish eateries like the Waterfront, Angelo's Italian Restaurant and 400 Gradi, as well as the bar and restaurant by celebrity chef Luke Mangan. Outside, by one of the many pools, you'll find a pizza restaurant and a burger bar, and further aft on the ship is Oasis, an adults-only space across multiple decks leading down to a pool. Here, passengers can enjoy the peace and quiet with cocktails and comfortable lounge-style deck chairs. Up on the highest deck, you'll even find a beach club. The ship has a winding water slide, sports courts, bars and nightclubs, a big screen theatre, the Black Circus dinner and stage show, a main show lounge, a comprehensive fitness centre with full sauna complex and a bustling casino. The sheer array of passenger amenities is dazzling and it's hard to imagine something that isn't catered to. Strathaird, by comparison, looks quaint, but passengers still had a lot of fun with what they had. Marine zoologist Isabel Bennett and her sister Jean were passengers aboard that cruise, and Isabel remembered that Christmas Day at sea was just fantastic. There was much celebrating, beginning with a carol service, and the highlight was a dinner with all the trimmings. The tables were laden with food, the boar's head, the pheasants, it was superb. We had lots of activities during that cruise, including deck games, fancy dress ball, and dancing every night. One of the highlights for passengers was a pyjama parade where everybody wore their sleepwear and formed a long human chain that snaked its way around the ship. After a few days, Strathaird arrived at the beautiful Norfolk Island and anchored under a brilliant sun. Isabel remembered that the splendid Norfolk Island pines were still there. It was a big occasion for the island, they had never before been visited by such a ship. Strathaird stood off the port and we were ferried ashore by the ship's lifeboats. We visited the little church built by Melanesian missionaries which is still one of the island's attractions. When passengers had had their fill of fun for the day, they retired to their cabins to rest. And here there is another massive difference between Strathaird and the Pacific Encounter. The public rooms on Strathaird were comfortable and cosily decorated, and the first class state rooms followed suit, offering one and two berth cabins. The only way to describe these cabins is homey, featuring lush carpets and polished timber panelling. 
At the time, this set a whole new standard for passengers on the long voyage out to Australia and was part of the draw for passengers going on a cruise in the first place. Tourist class cabins were a much more simple affair though, with white, enamel walled interiors and bunks with very basic washstands. It was a bit stark and typically the only light allowed into the ship's cabin was through a porthole somewhere between 9 and 15 inches or 22 and 38 centimetres wide. This is where Pacific Encounter differs vastly from the old Strathaird of 90 years ago, because as designed, of the 935 outside facing passenger staterooms aboard, about 80% feature their own private balcony. For the passengers on Strathair, this was just an unheard of luxury, and the only way to get fresh air would be to open a porthole or stretch your legs out on deck. Passengers on Pacific Encounter can relax on their own balcony with a glass of wine and just watch the ocean go by, a luxury which was found, in 1932, only aboard the grandest and most celebrated, luxurious transatlantic ocean liners at the time, like the Normandy, and even then, only in the most expensive suites and cabins reserved purely for celebrities, financiers, and heads of state. Another surprising difference is in the layout of the bathrooms. It may actually surprise you to learn that back in the 20s and 30s, ships' bathrooms were still a very communal affair. Toilets and showers were located not in your staterooms, but out in the hallways. On Strathaird, only 11 of the ship's most luxurious suites featured private toilets and baths, and for the rest of the ship's 1,100 passengers, the communal bathrooms were the only option. Of course, on the Pacific Encounter, all of the nearly 1,800 cabins feature their own, well-appointed, private bathrooms. Differences in comfort and luxury don't end there. On Strathair, the most expensive first-class cabins were relatively small and looked out into the promenade deck and featured a bed, a washstand and a wardrobe. By contrast, Pacific Encounter's grand suites are absolutely enormous, about 615 square feet or 57 square meters, with a huge private balcony featuring lounges and chairs, a sitting room, a lounge, and sleeping space for four people. Again, just like the private balconies, this level of luxury could only have been attained in 1932 aboard the most luxurious and celebrated passenger liners in the world, and even then, only if you are somebody of importance. The key area of difference between the two ships is in the way they were built to begin with, and construction has come a long way since then. How ships are built impacts their sea keeping, that is to say their ability to sail and provide a comfortable platform for passengers and their overall safety. Strathaird was built in the traditional way by the Vickers Armstrong Shipyard at Barrow, England, a world-class shipbuilder who won many contracts for the Navy to build dreadnought battleships. The ship they built in 1930 for P&O was of the highest possible quality. Held together with millions of rivets, most of them hand-driven red-hot into place, the skeleton of the Strathaird took shape. The process was virtually the same as all the other passenger ships of the time. Individual steel plates were laid down in a line to create the keel, or the ship's backbone. From this steel spine could be attached the ship's ribs. Huge steel frames bent individually into shape to give the ship's hull its curved form. Then to the frames were riveted steel plates, up to 1.5 inches or 3.5 centimetres thick, the ship's skin. The plates were about 30 feet or 9.1 metres long, and when they were all attached the ship's hull was almost complete. It was empty of course, a hulk with just the bare steel decks riveted into place. The ship's cavernous interiors would be filled after the launch, so on a sunny Saturday afternoon in 1931, in front of a crowd of thousands, the brand new gleaming Strathaird thundered down into the water and floated for the very first time. By contrast, the Pacific Encounter was built in an era where efficiency reigned absolute supreme. Originally built as the Star Princess, the ship was laid down at the legendary shipyard of renowned shipbuilder Fincantieri. This massive company has built hundreds of passenger ships over the years across eight shipyards, and today they are the fourth largest shipbuilder in the world. Pacific Encounter was built in a way that would have seemed totally alien to Strathaird's builders. There were no riveting teams, no red-hot iron rivets. Instead, huge chunks of the ship's hull were welded together by an army of helmeted welders, and instead of building the ship up bit by bit, whole sections could be prefabricated and welded together. Not only is welding stronger than riveting, but the steel itself, the ship's skin and backbone, is today of far higher quality than steel of the early 20th century in Strathaird's day. Strathaird was built at a very interesting time in history where technology had improved so, so rapidly that for a long time the industry was just trying to keep up. Early on in the 1900s, the idea of the unsinkable ship began to take hold. You may have heard this word applied to the Titanic. It was used by the ship's builders in a pamphlet to mark the ship's construction in 1910, but what you may not know is that it was applied to other ships of the time too, including the Titanic's competitors, the Lusitania and the Mauritania. 
The idea of the unsinkable ship was based in confidence, which at the time seemed well earned. See, for centuries, ships had been going out to sea and getting wrecked, or even just outright disappearing. To sail for any great distance was a bit of a gamble for passengers, but by the 1900s, ships were built at a scale that only 10 or 20 years earlier would have been thought totally unimaginable. Shipboard electricity, automatically closing watertight doors, and complex subdivisions meant shipbuilders were confident their ships could not be sunk. But then, they did sink. Most famous of all was the Titanic, then the Empress of Ireland, the Lusitania, and the Titanic's much safer sister ship, Britannic. These four ship sinkings, two in peacetime and two in wartime, killed the notion of the unsinkable ship. Now the industry and the general public knew that ships could sink in the absolute worst case scenario, and it meant that they could plan better for this eventuality. Strathaird was built with 11 watertight bulkheads, huge steel walls inside the ship that ran across its width. In the event of an emergency, this could be closed off with watertight doors that sealed the rooms inside, creating 12 individual watertight compartments from which water couldn't escape. The bulkheads rose high up in the ship's interior, almost the full height of the ship's hull, a lesson drawn from the Titanic disaster. As well as this, the ship was fitted with a cellular double bottom that would prevent damage from grounding or anything else ripping up into the ship from below and piercing into the critical boiler and engine rooms. Modern cruise ships are designed and built with similar safety features, and the Pacific Encounter is no exception. One key difference surrounds the watertight doors. In today's shipping world, they must always be closed while at sea. This means if you're a crew member and you live in a stateroom in one compartment, to visit your friend just five feet away in a cabin in the next compartment over, you'll have to climb stairs up and over the bulkhead just to go and say hi. This is all for good reason though. In December 1998, the cruise ship Monarch of the Seas ran into trouble off St. Martin when it struck a rock or an uncharted reef. The ship began to flood badly and its captain intentionally beached it on a sandbank so it wouldn't sink. All the passengers were evacuated safely and the ship was saved. An investigation into the accident revealed that the Monarch of the Seas would probably have actually still stayed afloat despite the fact that three of its compartments had fully flooded. It was the double bottom which had absorbed most of the damage and not allowed water to flood the other compartments, even though the gash ripped in the ship's bottom must have been about 400 feet or 121 meters long. Another real secret to the safety of modern ships like Pacific Encounter is their complex radar systems, something the Strathaird's builders and crew could hardly have dreamt of when their ship was being built. Modern long-range shipboard radar can detect dangers out to 72 nautical miles or 133 kilometers away and see through fog and storms. Back in the day, Strathaird's crew had to rely on their keen eyesight to look out for danger. Critically though, the way ships are captained and operated has changed too. In the early part of the 20th century, ships had to rely on traditional forms of navigation and the captain's word was final. Today, ships' captains and crews are not so fast and loose with the rules and for good reason. In 2012, the Costa Concordia's captain brought his ship far too close to an island, breaking protocols in a big way and endangering his ship. It struck rocks and was mortally damaged. You can't blame Costa Concordia's design and construction for its sinking. It just shouldn't have been there in the first place. By contrast, p and crews follow strict protocols and there are departments and teams on shore dedicated to charting out hazards and tides for ports around the world. Down in the engine room is where you'll see another huge change between Strathaird and Pacific Encounter. Strathaird was, for its time, a revolutionary ship for P&O. Traditionally, ships had been powered by steam engines, either big reciprocating blocks which stood up to three stories tall, or the more efficient Parsons turbines. But by the 1920s, a new form of propulsion had popped up and P&O was keen to test it. This was the turboelectric system. In this arrangement, boilers burn oil and heat water to produce steam and feed it into the turbines. The turbines spin, creating electricity, which powers electrical motors that spin the ship's propellers. Not only does this setup create a lot of electricity to power the ship's other systems, but it also means that the ship can turn or even reverse its engines almost immediately without the need for a complex, expensive, and delicate gearbox. It was also quieter to run than a traditional steam engine setup. And before committing to the concept, p and trialled it in their liner, the Viceroy of India, and it proved to be a hit. Strathaird was the third p and liner to get these engines, and they produced up to 28,000 shaft horsepower, and they allowed the ship to move its 22,000 ton bulk at up to 23 knots. By contrast, the Pacific Encounter was almost five times larger than Strathaird, and yet is still capable of moving at the same speed. But how? 
The answer is brute power. In the 1920s, while the turboelectric propulsion system was really taking off, another engine type was gaining traction, pun intended. This was the marine diesel engine. Instead of relying on spark plugs to ignite the fuel like in the petrol engine in your car, the diesel engines used compression to heat the cylinder chamber and ignite the fuel. Because of this, diesel engines have the highest engine efficiency of any combustion engine type and are capable of generating enormous amounts of torque and power. Over a hundred years of development has seen them refined into a true power plant powerhouse. Pacific Encounters 6 diesel engines can output a combined massive 85,000 horsepower while also generating electricity for the entire ship. That's Strathaird's 22,000 kilowatts of power versus Pacific Encounters 63,300. Believe it or not though, there are actually a few similarities between the two ships. For one thing, you'll notice they're both painted a brilliant white. Strathaird and her sister Strathnava were the first P&O ships to be painted white. This was a radical departure for the company. Since the 1800s, all of their ships had been painted with black hulls and a dark top. The look was drab, but it was ingrained in tradition. With Strathnaver and Strathair, the company wanted to break with tradition and signpost a whole brand new era. Painting the ships white would also help them keep cool in the warmer climates, because white reflects the sun's heat. This, in fact, started a new tradition for P&O, a tradition which is upheld to this day, and Pacific Encounter's towering hull is also painted a brilliant white. Some other things remained unchanged too. Pacific Encounter can trace its ancestry all the way back to ships like Strathaird and beyond. So up on the bow, the ship flies the exact same company house flag that Strathaird did all those years ago. Oh, a lot has changed since 1932, that's for sure. But it was pioneering vessels like the Strathaird that set new standards for comfort, luxury and safety for passengers all the way back in 1932 and paved the way for the mighty new and impressive vessels that we have today, like the Pacific Encounter over here. The first cruise from Australian waters by P&O was a game changer. Strathaird returned with a shipload of happy passengers in time for New Year's Eve, and a new standard had been set in place. Today, a cruise with P&O on the Pacific Encounter won't be the same as what you'd have found on Strathaird, of course. It'll be bigger and better in almost every way possible. You'll be able to lean back in your deck chair, remember back to the Strathaird and know that you are continuing on a truly historic tradition. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please think about liking and subscribing to the channel. You can support my channel on Patreon. You'll find the link down in the description. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.